Okay, very good. Um, welcome again to the lecture number four, uh, Strategic Creativity for Innovation, History of Innovation. We're going to discuss today a little bit of review, of course, and innovation in Korea. In the discussion session just before, we had some very good uh, uh, answers and discussion. Uh, the smartphone, the touch screen, the tea money card, uh, fried chicken, uh, uh, the touch, uh, I mentioned the touch screen, uh, and uh, the Galaxy, and uh, Hangul, and all this uh, uh, very good answers. So let's uh, start. And so we finished three lectures. We're in the middle of this history of innovation, and we're going to zoom in a little bit on the history of innovation in Korea. And second half of the course, we'll be talking, based on all this background, on some methods and applications. So uh, we had uh, this in the discussion session, and now we'll do a quick review. Uh, as mentioned, Rome is one of the original open innovators. And uh, a whole bunch of innovations came out of the uh, Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Concrete, newspapers, welfare, bound books, roads, uh, aqueducts, arches, Julian calendar, Roman law, and battlefield surgery. And as mentioned, this Roman law was very critical in establishing this open innovation. Uh, we talked about the Roman Empire, uh, going from the kingdom to the Republic to the empire, and all these city-states were eventually superseded by the Roman Empire, and it wasn't uh, so much uh, strength or power or resources. Uh, innovation was a key element to this uh, advances. And this is very important. We can see this playing out not just in history, but today. With the COVID-19 response, uh, innovation has been critical in uh, people in organizations and in countries addressing the COVID-19 response. People have said that Korea has responded reasonably well and uh, innovation was a big part of that. Uh, I should note, uh, and it's very important to understand this, is uh, nobody has a monopoly on innovation. Korea did not do very well in the marriage crisis in 2015. Uh, and in fact, uh, they learned a lot from that. And remember last time I mentioned about Ancora Imparo from Michelangelo, always learning. That learning from the bad experience has uh, inspired the innovation for the current experience. Uh, so this learning process we're going to talk about in the methods next time or ne in the second half of the course is very important for uh, innovation. As I mentioned, the, the Latin rite or the Roman law uh, facilitated this. So that allowed in this framework that we've been discussing for innovation, uh, the framework of differential fitness, phenotypic variation, and rentability of fitness, that open innovation allowed for this variation and, and new ideas to come in. We talked about Leonardo da Vinci and the convergence of science and art and some of the personal characteristics that led to his inventive thinking, though not always innovative. He was always curious about things. Uh, he was always seeing more, uh, thinking bigger, making connections between different fields, uh, embracing paradox, and always acting very boldly and courageously. We talked about the Mona Lisa as a combination of science and art, and some key lessons. Uh, personal lessons from these examples. Uh, be curious. We will do some assignments later on in the course that will test your curiosity. Uh, seek knowledge for its own sake, uh, not just to take an exam or not just to uh, satisfy a requirement, uh, but actually uh, be interested in the knowledge for its own sake have a kind of childlike sense of wonder. If you look at things and you want to innovate, uh, if you just look at it very like a very adult or very old person, why does the sun rise? Why is the sky blue? Uh, why is it that the T-Money card acts so fast, the transportation card? If you just say, well, that's the way it is, and you don't wonder about it, it's very difficult to uh, innovate. 
then be very keen observer. Leonardo da Vinci was a very close observer of phenomena, things that were strange, uh, how people acted, how they looked, uh, and uh, how nature uh, behaved and how nature uh, looked. So that ability for observation is very key. And we will have another assignment, short assignment, to do this observation. Look at uh, details. Details are very important. And also to see things that are unseen. So for example, let's take that transportation card example that I think uh, Yatu Yokudu mentioned, the transportation card. Uh, I've always wondered about that because she mentioned that the transportation card is registered in one station and immediately all the information is updated. So you go to the next station and it knows where you were. And that transportation card, I just think, and how it works behind is very fascinating. So you want to see things that are unseen, not just what is obvious in front of you. Uh, get uh, distracted. So it's important to be focused, of course, but sometimes innovation comes from something that is uh, outside of the focus. You remember the example we mentioned of Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin, 1928. Uh, so he was growing the bacteria and then he noticed some of the bacteria was dying. That was a distraction. Instead of just cleaning it up, and fixing the experiment, he saw things that were unseen, he observed, and he got distracted by that sort of unusual behavior and discovered penicillin. Uh, be very respectful of facts, and it's sometimes to procrastinate, let things uh, take some time, uh, and not always rushing. Another key thing is to think visually, to avoid uh, silos. Silos are uh, uh, confined tracks of knowledge or confined tracks of understanding to try to go outside those. Uh, to let your reach exceed your grasp. So you're trying to uh, accomplish something, but actually go beyond it. To uh, think about uh, science fiction, to think about fantasy. Uh, create also for yourself, not just the people paying for you, uh, to collaborate. Leonardo da Vinci did a lot of collaboration. He made a lot of lists and always went back to those lists of interesting phenomena, interesting facts. Uh, take notes. Uh, we now do a lot of things uh, on our smartphones, but to take notes on paper is very important. And to be open to mystery. These are some of the key lessons from Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and I've given some examples. Uh, so think about some of these ideas, and we will do some short uh, assignments later in this course to develop some of these ideas. Uh, Marius, you had a question? Uh, so avoid silos is uh, can be translated to like uh, think outside the box? Yeah, that's uh, one way to think of it. Uh, people get boxed in into specific ways of uh, thinking or specific uh, disciplines, specific fields, biology, chemistry. Uh, so avoid these silos. Uh, at uh, DIGIST, the Daegu Gyeongbok Institute of Technology, I teach a course on bioelectromagnetics. There's biology is one silo, one box. Physics is another silo, another box. But we bring them together in bioelectromagnetics, and it is a frontier, as I see it, and I think uh, others do too, but it's a frontier for innovation in medicine. Okay. Think about this uh, COVID-19 virus. The, and we want to detect it, right? So now we have a box, and we call that box biochemistry. We use biochemistry to test for the virus. It's either a PCR test, or an antigen test, or an antibody test, right? That's a biochemistry of one molecule binding to another molecule and then the readout in the test, right? That's the box. And we can innovate around that and make the test faster and more accurate and so forth. But imagine if we had an electromagnetic test 
So the virus had some sort of uh, proteins that had a electromagnetic signal. Just like you can see my hand here. It's, it, you're not seeing it biochemically. You're seeing it because there's visible light bouncing off it, right? You are seeing my hand electromagnetically. So imagine, you know, there's virus here and we can find some electromagnetic radiation to detect that. That's the concept in bioelectromagnetics. And if that's possible, that would be an innovation. And it comes from not being in one silo. So now everybody's trying to innovate in the silo of biochemistry. But uh, sometimes you have to think outside of that. So that's an example. I'm not saying it will happen, but it's something I'm thinking about and uh, hopefully others as well. Thank you for the question. So we talked about uh, Michelangelo and how he was innovating uh, with the David. And again, some of his key characteristics were internalization of challenge, not just competing with other people, but competing inside. Now, this is very interesting. I'm going to tell you an interesting story. Uh, I had a friend, uh, fellow graduate student, a long time ago, graduate student, and he was a Japanese graduate student. And uh, we had a coffee one time. This is uh, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And he was a very uh, smart Japanese student, University of Tokyo, and he was very competitive. And it was kind of like the Japanese and a little bit like the Korean system of competition with other people. You know, only so many people can get to the university. Only so many people can pass the exam. You're competing with other people. And Japan is the same way. He went to the University of Tokyo, best university. He got the good grades and all that. And so we were talking about competition. And uh, I told him my personal philosophy of I don't like to compete with other people. I compete with my own standard. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm like Michelangelo, but this is my feeling of uh, competition. And I I told him I thought it was important for innovation because if you're only competing with other people, it's like what Marius said, you are in a box of competition, right? But if you uh, internalize it and not just judge yourself by your exam score relative to other people, you can think outside the box. And then he told me something that absolutely shocked me. And I still remember him telling me that. He said, that's very interesting, your concept of internalization of challenge. He said, that means you are very selfish. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. And actually he was kind of right. And it was a little bit, I, I'm generalizing a little bit, but uh, an Asian concept that if you are out on your own, uh, it's a way you're selfish. And uh, I thought that was a very interesting concept. So it's not like one concept of competition is better than the other concept. There are positives and negatives to both. But in some ways, if you want to innovate, you have to internalize that challenge. If you want to go outside that box. So in a way, you have to be selfish and that can be uncomfortable. So I tell you this story because people are uncomfortable being selfish, right? I don't want to be considered selfish. You don't want to be considered selfish. But what my point is, if you want to truly innovate, in some ways you have to be selfish. Michelangelo felt that he was the best person to make this statue. He felt that he was the best person to paint the Sistine Chapel. That's a little bit selfish. Uh, so this is, you know, innovation is not just a technical thing. It involves emotions. It involves human relations. Uh, and it's not easy. When we went back to Leonardo da Vinci, if you look at the previous slide, and the, uh, sorry, uh, this one about uh, I was 
a long time ago, excuse me. Courageous action, uh, you have to overcome some of these inhibitions. So he took up this challenge of the Sistine Chapel, he innovated in art, uh, and that's a very important uh, lesson that we can take. So if we look at our framework of innovation, this theory of innovation, the three features and its implications, we see that uh, both uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, uh, they had this vi the variation, the different ideas, thinking uh, among silos and so forth, but they were always constantly testing their ideas with an actual real block of marble, uh, with dr drawings, uh, with uh, interactions with others. So it's that uh, tension between the individual and the group uh, and competing and testing with others, but also uh, doing your own ideas as well. Uh, so that's some of the concepts that uh, are exemplified by this history. Uh, in the second part of the course, we are going to examine in more detail these methods, these personal methods, and these organizational methods for innovation. But I just wanted to give you some flavor of that. So the famous quote by Michelangelo, ancora in paro, yet I am learning. And as I said, I think this informs our understanding of how Korea has been responding to the COVID-19 situation with innovation. Uh, the mayor's Middle Eastern respiratory uh, syndrome situation in 2015 was a very difficult one. Uh, some of you may have read about, some of you may have experienced, but the government and many of the senior leaders in the health and public health uh, said we have to learn from this experience. And that kind of attitude and mindset has led to innovation. We didn't test people for mares. We didn't uh, control uh, the uh, contacts uh, for mares, uh, and a lot of those mistakes were avoided and uh, improved procedures instituted. Any questions so far? No? So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, innovation in Korea, some global comparisons the history of innovation Korea with some selected innovations, some of which you have already noted in our discussion before the lecture. And we'll focus on King Sejong, uh, in some ways the Korean uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So there have been several rankings of innovation. And here's one, it's called the Bloomberg Ranking. Uh, it was done in 2018. And some of you may remember this, and Korea came out uh, number one uh, Sweden was number two, Singapore was third, and so forth. And this was a score uh, that was based on various uh, factual resources, including World Bank data, uh, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the uh, OECD data. Uh, and there were seven criteria that were uh, measured. Uh, the intensity of R&D per capita, the value add manufacturing, uh, productivity, the high tech density, the tertiary education, universities, research concentration, and patent activity. Now, when you measure innovation, and next, uh, later, in a later lecture, we're gonna talk about measurements of innovation. It's very complicated. How do you measure innovation? And in fact, in some ways, it's a little bit arbitrary. And uh, depending on the criteria you choose, you will get a certain result. And it turns out that these seven criteria, cre criteria which they seem objective, were perfectly oriented for innovation in Korea. There's a fairly high degree of R&D intensity uh, Korea is focused a lot on manufacturing value add, uh, and so televisions, automobiles, uh, ships, uh, electronics, and so forth. Uh, productivity may not be the, 
the top issue or top strength in Korea, but definitely high tech density. Uh, lots of tertiary education. Some would argue maybe there's too much uh, research concentration and the companies in Korea love to produce patents. I think Samsung produces the second highest number of patents in the world. And it turns out that Samsung actually is a very important contributor uh, to this ranking. So my question to you, here's a number one South Korea. Would you agree with this assessment that Korea is the most innovative country in the world? Any thoughts? We're not going to ask everybody, but just a couple of you. What's your opinion? Kizai? Yes. Yes, uh, because you know the first uh, superior uh, the country is USA and second one is China. But the, and we know that the uh, the apples like this is uh, the number one company in the in the world ranking, yeah. and the mo most important competitor of the apple is Samsung. Right. <laughs> it is not what, Huawei what, or me. It's Samsung. Right. And Korea is much more dense, and so uh, in some respects, uh, that position is to be very high. Uh, any other opinions? Uno Wan, you want to answer? Yeah, I I think it's uh, Korea can be the most innovative uh, country because not only their technology is very uh, at more advanced than some of the country, but their um, lifestyle, uh, like the implement, the implement, the implementation of their uh, technology in the in their uh, daily life and their system is very good. Like not many country in the world have um, like um, systematic. Uh, or like the the waste management system. Yes. Yeah, it's. So, I think it's very good in Korea, unlike many country. Yeah. So I think it's it's like. Uh, so you can anybody uh, disagree? Uh, who feels uh, for some reason in this uh, measurement, South Korea is not most innovative any any comments on that for me i'm kind of surprised that uh korea is the most innovation i thought this would be like america because my thought that i was really surprised when i see this case. yes so th th this is uh interesting i mean it's very hard to actually say what is the most innovative it depends on these criteria and maybe it uh, may not be true in you know, some other areas. Uh, so let's look at this in a little bit more detail. This is the World uh, Economic Forum ranking. Uh, it's another uh, ranking and it puts, this is the global competitiveness report, the top 10 uh, innovative countries. And here they put Switzerland number one. So this is a world, the World Economic Forum. United States number two, Israel third, Finland fourth, and actually South Korea was not on this list, but this was also 2018. So I guess my point is uh, these rankings can be very arbitrary. And uh, we will talk about it, as I mentioned, in more detail, but actually there, is, there isn't a really good way to measure innovation. I mean, how do we measure the Leonardo da Vinci's? How do we measure the Michelangelo's? We can measure certain things like number of patents and technology penetration and R&D dollars, but somehow we have a sense it doesn't necessarily capture innovation. So I'm not saying that this report is uh, correct. So their criteria were 12 pillars of competitiveness, institutions, infrastructure, macroeconomic environment, health and primary education, higher education training, uh, various market efficiencies, financial market development, uh, technology uh, in the uh, environment, market size, business sophistication, and so forth. And all of these were put together, and this is their 
innovative economy uh, index. So uh, I think the conclusion is still out, you know, which is the most innovative country. I don't think that's very important. In fact, uh, the Romans would have said, uh, it's not important that we're the most innovative. The Romans would say, it's best that we just bring in innovation from outside. And if you're, if you're not internally necessarily the most innovative, how you bring innovations from outside and implement those makes you, you know, more innovative. Uh, so my fundamental argument is there is no best and most innovative country. The most innovative country, the most innovative company, and the most innovative person will be the one that's open to as many ideas from the outside as possible and able to bring those together and implement them. Does that make sense? Yeah, professor. That's very important. Uh, and we already talked about this. What do you think? Uh, so let's move to uh, some uh, selected innovations in Korean history. So in the 15th century, we had the heated greenhouse. And in fact, you still see a lot of that out in Korea with uh, covered uh, farms. And so uh, it turns out that the climate in Korea is not so optimal for farming. First of all, you have the mountains. So uh, it's not like uh, wide plains. And uh, uh, you can have very big temperature variations between the seasons and so forth. Uh, but they were able to make heated greenhouses that could grow oranges and uh, uh, during the winter and uh, uh, could regulate the temperature and humidity much closer. And so uh, Korea, given some of the challenges in geography and climate, is still able to produce a fairly diverse range of agricultural products. Uh, was able to and still is with the heated greenhouse. Uh, another uh, innovation was the first well-known rain gauge uh, the Chukugi is called, it uh, measures how much uh, rainwater. And this was very important during King Sejong to measure uh, rainfall and measure uh, climate, and they could optimize the farming and uh, other activities related to that. Uh, a very famous uh, scientist who worked during the time of King Sejong, you could regard him as the Leonardo da Vinci of Korea, was uh, Yang Jong. Yang Yong Shil, uh, Jang Yong Shil, excuse me, uh, Jang Yong Shil invented a mechanical water clock. And we're going to talk about Jang Yong Shil a little mo more detail. And of course, two of you mentioned at the beginning of the class Hangul uh, as a, a scientific uh, alphabet, or it's not quite an alphabet, but a writing system. Uh, and uh, that was a significant advance in improving literacy. Now, of course, we have uh, virtually 100% literacy in Korea. Uh, of course, we're in the modern age, but that was achieved uh, quite a while ago. And Hangul is very easy to, to learn and to use. Uh, we talked about the Gutenberg print, printing press, and we said Chinese also were very early. But actually, the first movable type, the first printing press, was actually uh, invented in Korea. Uh, it was predating Gutenberg's invention by about two uh, centuries. And uh, so a number of texts were produced with that movable type. And then one of you mentioned, and I agree with you, one of the best innovations is the ondol, or the underfloor heating. It dates back about two, over 2,000 years. Uh, invented by in Korea and used widely uh, to this day. Uh, so one of the, uh, it's about found for uh, over 2,500 years. So let's talk a little about King Sejong. Uh, this is familiar to if you visited uh, Seoul. He was from 1418 to 1450, uh, one of the kings uh, in Korea. And uh, he, uh, had a number of social innovations that enabled uh, this uh, scientific and technological innovation. 
One of them was by breaking class barriers. And this was very interesting because if people are in their own uh, sort of silos, in their own boxes, and uh, ideas cannot be shared or uh, ideas cannot come to fruition, that creates an impediment to innovation. And by breaking some class barriers, it allowed the poor people to, to contribute their ideas. And that was a very important uh, stimulus to innovation. Uh, introduced, uh, similar to the Chinese system, a meritocracy, where people could achieve a higher position on the basis of uh, their abilities, as documented in exams and so forth. Uh, and then by virtue of Hangul, uh, in particular language, the dissemination of that knowledge. So if we look at these three factors, it's very interesting. You remember we had the three factors of evolution, of hereditability of fitness, that's the dissemination of knowledge. So ideas can spread. We had differential fitness, in other words, your idea is tested against reality. That's called meritocracy. In other words, you have to uh, uh, prove yourself and you have to prove your ideas and you have to prove your ability. And then the third element of the evolutionary theory of innovation is that phenotypic variation and breaking the class barriers that allowed many people to contribute their ideas not just certain classes, allowed for that variation. So if you think of a social system and a social innovation, uh, King Sejong doing these things in a substantial way, one would not be surprised that it was a period of innovation in Korea. So just like the Roman Empire had created the ability to disseminate uh, knowledge, it had created uh, uh, openness to new ideas, so the phenotypic variation that you, we talked about. Obviously, their social innovations were different, but uh, this is what we would call setting up a system for innovation. So one of the most famous scientists at that time was Zhang Yong-shil from 1390 to 1442. Uh, and indeed, he was not born into the aristocracy. He was a peasant born, it's related to this breaking class barriers. And he went to what's called the Jipyeonjun, this uh, special academy uh, set up by King uh, Sejong, and that was this meritocracy. So he uh, entered the educational system. And he had uh, quite a few selected discoveries. Uh, one was uh, astronomical instruments, uh, iron printing press we, we saw, the water clock that we had seen, the sundial, various weapons and materials for those weapons, the rain gauge that we saw, and the water gauge. And these were innovations that uh, uh, he uh, discovered. So what's interesting is the tragedy of Jang yong Shil and Korean innovation. Eventually, he was... Uh, demoted from his position and eliminated by the king uh, because on one of his inventions the king had gotten injured and people around him had uh, uh, seen that as an opportunity and blamed Jang yong Shil for that and that was his end and so that's very interesting uh, we talked about Korean innovation in many ways that Korea is innovative. But if we look at the social structures in Korea and how it's very important not to be different and very important to conform to group expectations, we see that there are pressures against innovation. Uh, and we think of that as a modern phenomena. Young people in Korea say, well, it's so difficult, we have so many expectations, it's so competitive, uh, you know, we don't, we're not able to be free in our thinking and, and all that. This is not a new phenomenon, this was experienced back then. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is I think Korea has been very innovative, 
but I think there could be more ways that we can open up and, uh, and uh, enable innovation in Korea. Uh, so you remember that discussion I had with the Japanese student? It was very interesting. He regarded my independent thinking as being selfish. And uh, that's a big challenge because to be innovative and to be Jang Yong Shil, you have to have a little bit of in a independent thinking. You have to sometimes make some mistakes. And if you cannot make mistakes and you cannot be independent thinking, then you will never get these innovations. So that's the big challenge in Korean society or in any society is how do we you know, balance uh, uh, social uh, harmony with uh, individual freedom uh, so that we have the necessary level of innovation. Now you might say innovation is a luxury. We don't need innovation. We don't need smartphones. We don't need uh, you know, uh, fried chicken. <laughs> but actually innovation is absolutely critical. Without innovation, we cannot solve problems of a pandemic. We cannot uh, address uh, climate change. We cannot address uh, you know, other challenges, uh, natural disasters and so forth. So innovation is not a fancy luxury. It is absolutely essential to human survival. Now you're in a business school and the title of this course is uh, Strategic Management, uh, Strategic Creativity for Innovation. So the same holds true for companies. If you start a company, uh, and you don't have innovation, you will eventually fail. And that's a very interesting problem because, uh, you know, the function of company is to make money. So you focus on making money. And if you focus only on that without thinking of new ways to do things, new ways to improve and new innovation, eventually that will um, start to uh, be less successful and eventually fail. So innovation is very uh, central. And so it's a social phenomena that uh, we have to address. Any thoughts? Any comments? Marius, you look like you're thinking of something. No? Not, not really. Like I was, uh, I was thinking about what you said about the the human and societal societal factors in uh, in terms of innovation, and uh, I can agree on that. Yeah. So, what is your uh, you're uh, from Germany originally? Yeah. So, what is your view on kind of the societal framework in Germany? Is is it supportive of innovation? Are there challenges? Yeah, currently they are definitely walking towards uh, a more innovative society. Yes. Um, in organizations, it, it has already been uh, like more innovative because um, when when you got an innovation, it was uh, or or something that changed the the company and helped it. Uh, it was always clear that you that you get an incentive yeah so it was it was always um, yeah it pushed uh, the employees to to come up with with the good ideas um, but all in all from the from the society and all that um, sometimes when you when you got a good idea uh, it depends on how the society is um, um, accepting Yes, accepting and reacting to it. Yes. So, um, yeah, that definitely harms uh, innovation. So, if you think, "Oh, is that right?" or "Am I, am I having a, a dumb thought or something?" Yes. Um, but I think uh, it it changes over the time now. So it's very interesting. The German ex uh, experience is. Uh, I was very fascinated with Angela Merkel's decision to. Uh, bring all those uh, migrants in. Obviously, very controversial decision. Uh, and it was very interesting. I, I think uh, she talked a lot about the, 
humanitarian aspects and moral aspects. And uh, I don't want to, I know it's a very political issue, but I just thought it was very fascinating because uh, it'd be interesting to see how much new ideas and innovation and changes came out of a result of that. And uh, we saw this in America, uh, but uh, just before World War II, a lot of refugees came to America and uh, a lot of innovation came out of that, uh, atomic bomb and things like that. So I'm following that situation, not so much the political issues, you know, immigration, all this, I think that's very complicated, but I'm following it from an innovation mindset. Um, oh, definitely. Um, the the majority of European countries has, uh, has seen it as a, uh, because they were fearing that yeah. they that they couldn't stand the uh, all the people coming to to their countries, so that it uh, has like a big economical backlash. Yes. But instead, uh, definitely, um, Miss Merkel uh, has seen opportunities in it. So I think this was something more uh, an innovative think thinking. Right. Because so many, so many, so many. Um, uh, skilled workers are missing in in German, uh, which could uh, um, gain a success to to the economy. So she has seen it, and um, yes, is developing in this way uh, the 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 whole situation to a to a positive outcome. Right. Thank you very much, Maris. Uh, Dinda, what country do you come from? Um, I am from Indonesia. From where? Indonesia. Indonesia. So how is the uh, innovation environment your sense in Indonesia? Mm, I'm just talking it with my friend, but I don't really think Indonesian have a specialty in innovation. Wait, let me think first. <laughs> it's a complicated question. Putri, uh, <laughs> where are you from? Uh, I'm from Indonesia, just like Linda. Also. So what do you think? Uh, <laughs> we just shared the same question about uh, what actually made Indonesia an uh, inve invention, uh, invention country. Uh -huh. um, since Indonesia is still a uh, developed country i guess there's not much uh, about some invention they just they still um developing what other countries do in indonesia <laughs> okay. well remember we had a discussion in the first lecture about reverse innovation where mm -hmm. ideas in less developed countries can be yep. innovative Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's part of the problem uh, in the United States and Germany. You know, they get to a certain level of development and they get comfortable. And uh, uh, it's harder to innovate. Whereas you have uh, less developed countries, the resources are limited, uh, and there's less money. There's, uh, you know, you can't. You can't cover up mistakes so easily, uh, so you have to innovate. Uh, so that's uh, that's interesting. Gunawan, how about you? Um, yeah, I'm also from Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, uh, the same as uh, Dinda and Putri's opinion. I think in Indonesia, there, um, there's not many not as much opportunity uh, uh yeah and also the society is not very competitive to make some innovation so yeah not a lot of interesting like yeah so uh kazai how about you um i'm from kyrgyzstan it's in central asia uh, kyrgyzstan yes 
Yes, and um, I think that in my country, the opportunity for innovation is a lot. Now in my country, situation about the startup ideas, about innovation is now boiling. <laughs> so, uh, but the main um, problem is in my country is uh, we are only 6 million. <laughs> ah, yeah. So that's why a lot of companies are just uh, reaching to become international, like uh, to reach uh, the audience in neighboring countries. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's very important. Very, it's very interesting when we have this COVID nineteen. There's a big, uh, how should I say, pressure against the international aspect. We cannot fly, we cannot interact, right? So that's that's the opposite of the Roman Empire. That's the opposite of uh, King Sejong and and so forth. So countries that can somehow manage to bring in outside ideas, but also manage this uh, situation, I think uh, can be very successful, but it's not easy. Uh, Nam May, you raise your hand. Where are yeah, you from? I, I was from a bit about Vietnam. Like, where? I feel like Vietnam. Vietnam, oh, Vietnam. okay. What's yeah, the feeling there? Like the innovation in Vietnam is not developed at all. Uh, you know, for example, you know the flat bird, the, the, the game, flat people. No. Uh, uh, it's like, it's more popular since 2040. It is like a worldwide popular game for the birds, like flying and cross the world. But then later, because it's people in Vietnam like, didn't do it, and then later on, it didn't work. In the end, so I think the innovation in Vietnam is kind of limited. The government doesn't support, and also the society. And some people who are like don't have the degree, like professor degree or something like that, but there's also innovation in the countryside. Yeah. But the government doesn't give the money for them to develop the product. So, so I read a lot. Yes. Lots of challenges there. Uh, they don't have the money to develop the product and deeper innovation the product. Okay. And uh, Katie Peterson, where are you from and what's your thoughts? Um, I'm from Estonia. And where is that? for us, um, Estonia. Uh, Estonia. Uh, Finland, Finland. It's under Finland. <laughs> yes, I know. Very small. So I heard there was a, a lot of innovation in Estonia. Uh, yes, but in my opinion, it's more of or focused towards technology. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of startups also, and mostly everything is about technology and innovation there. Like we have uh, our e-government, we have Skype, we right. uh, we have uh, e-citizenship, so people would come to Estonia to establish new businesses, and yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's an important point because I think sometimes innovation is equated only with information technologies uh, and of course that's a very important part of it but uh, innovation is much broader than that uh, and uh, it's interesting that you note that Estonia seems to be very focused on these information aspects uh, e-government as you mentioned and so forth but I think there are broader concepts uh, Mao Wensheng what thank you Katie Mao Wensheng what what are your thoughts you're from China right yeah I'm from China so how is the feeling in innovation there? Uh, you know, in China, I have many innovations, but I think uh, recently is uh, about many like infrastructure, mm -hmm. like high high speed rail technology or some space technology. So most of the innovations focused on infrastructure. Yes. Now right. recently is uh, like this. Well, that's a very interesting point that you make because actually this infrastructure uh, is very useful in stimulating other innovations. So if people can transport very well, if that will uh, increase the amount of ideas and difference of ideas. So I think this infrastructure is important, uh, but it will be very interesting to see what other innovations come out of that. And that will require 
obviously uh, some other changes and so forth. Uh, let's go to Mukhad Med Ildai. Ahmed Ran. Ahmed Ran. Yes. Yeah. I'm from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yes. Yeah, but we are a young country. Like we took over independence in 1991, and uh, I don't think that Kazakhstan is quite innovative country. But we are producing. But we are oil producing countries. Mm. And uh, I think we found something in innovative in in natural resources, how to find it, and okay. in oil producing. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Ayata Yokudu, where are you from? Hello? Uh, let's go to Inzu. Hello, Professor. I'm here. Sorry. So, My, where are you from, and what's what's your feeling on innovation in in your country? Sorry, my mic was off. Uh, I'm from South Sudan. Yes. And, uh, my country is the youngest country in the whole world. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it got its independence in 2011, and as a young country, we really don't have so much. However, as you say that innovation is driven by information technology, which is true. And uh, the problem here is that um, even if people might have some good ideas or maybe like some ideas that are productive that could maybe drive innovation, however, the support is very limited and sometimes there is no support and people are not motivated mm. to at least to like create something, even if they have the idea. So that's the biggest problem. And um, I think still the country is like kind of working hard to make sure that things are put in place. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have two more people, Inzu Atsanova. Inzu Atsanova, any thoughts? Uh, we'll go to Sheng Zizu. Okay, I'm here, Professor. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from China. So my answer is mobile payment. Mobile payment is very important. But do you, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what do you think about the overall environment for in innovation in China? Overall environment. Um, uh, Difficult question. Yeah, uh, um, I'm not sure. Sorry. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's proceed, uh, and we'll we'll finish up. Okay. This is just in uh, Korean, and I apologize, but it uh, means that if you want to travel very far uh, and cross the ocean, you have to leave the coast. And uh, one of the very interesting aspects about Korean innovation, and it was dominated a lot, has been dominated a lot by Samsung, and you gave some examples. This is the example of uh, Samsung construction. They had built uh, oil storage plants in Libya in 1981. And uh, 1981 in Libya was not a good place to be. Uh, I think it was in 1982, the Americans bombed Tripoli. They almost killed Gaddafi. Uh, it was considered a terrorist state and uh, there was a lot of uh, very dangerous situation. And uh, the Samsung people went there and they did construction projects. Nothing special really, just uh, basically these oil storage plants. But uh, from that, kind of going beyond outside. For example, Kazai was talking about Kyrgyzstan and they're trying to be more international. I think, uh, you know, as you know, Samsung also built the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. Uh, and you can go from very simple things like this to, uh, you know, very big uh, projects and innovation. So this is similar to what we talked about with Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. Uh, you have to have certain courage, you have to go outside your box. And I think this was, this is a, a good example of that. 
So next week, we're going to talk uh, about innovation and the scientific method in particular. And um, uh, we will approach some of the innovation methods as it relates to science in more uh, uh, detail. Any questions, any thoughts? No? Okay, I wanted to mention two things. We're gonna have three short assignments. They're more than just a very short one. Uh, three short assignments, about one page each. Uh, will be coming up uh, uh, in the subsequent lectures. So I will start to share those with you. They will be assignments about uh, developing curiosity, uh, developing uh, observation, and developing a passion for improvement. Uh, three core principles of innovation. So uh, be ready for that, uh, and I'll give you more details uh, later. Okay, thank you very much. We'll end for today. Have a good night. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank, thank you. you Have a thank good you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. We'll see you next thank week. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you, Professor.